Good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are joining me for the very first time, my name is Dahlia, and I have been sharing on this channel nothing but the Word of God. So if you're joining me for the first time, thank you so much. Please remember to hit the like button and to subscribe, but also share the video. It's not just about sharing the video, but it's about sharing the message. So share the message. If you're blessed by this message, please share the message with someone else so they too can be blessed by the word of God. I post on Mondays and on Fridays, where Friday, which is today, you know what time it is. It is prayer time Friday, yes. And prayer time Friday, Friday is not a special day or whatever. It's just that particular time I set aside to encourage you and to remind you to pray because prayer is important. Prayer is important. And I also remind you that prayer is a two-way street. When you lay down for God, you better wait for him, listen for him to lay back down to you. I'm telling you, you don't need to go to anybody for a word from God. You don't need to go to anybody for direction if you will take the time to listen to him when he speaks he speaks but the question is are you listening so today's prayer theme is a great reminder for all of us because sometimes we have to check ourselves sometimes we have to examine our own self to make sure we are on the path because what you see sometimes in society and on social media is that sometimes people are their own worst enemy. People are their own worst enemy. They get into their own way. They get into their own way because they become their own worst enemy. They self-sabotage. And sometimes that thing that does it is the attitude. So today's prayer theme is attitude is everything. You've heard it before. It's a popular saying, attitude is everything, but let's get into it. Let's get some scripture and let's see how we can better ourselves as believers. And if you're not a believer, I invite you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and he will come in and you can you know, write me a message, um, make a comment, and I will help you further to come into the kingdom of God, to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, you will be on your way to a great life in Christ Jesus. So this story picks up in 2 Kings chapter 5. I talked about it a little bit in the lesson on Monday in the book of John. Join us on Mondays. We are in the book of John. I post on Mondays with the word and on Fridays prayer time. So join me and remember to like the video, share it, share it. You're not sharing it, you know, because you're sharing the word. You're spreading the gospel. When you share this video, you are helping me to share, to spread the gospel around the world to those who will receive Jesus Christ. So you will have a reward in sharing um, in the blessings of God by sharing the word of God and sharing the video to everyone. And so we pick up this story in second Kings and it's about a great man, but he had a problem. This man is called Naaman. And if you've never heard the story, you're going to hear it here today. But his name is Naaman. And this happened in a time where Israel had lost the war to Syria. They had lost the war to Syria. And so Naaman was the captain of the Syrian army. He was a man of valor. He was a great man. He was honorable, right? He was a very powerful man because he was what? The chief military commander. So he was powerful and he was the captain, the chief. Get that in your head. He had some power, but he had a problem. He had a disease. And this disease was incurable. There was no cure for it. It's known as leprosy. Even today, you know, if you come in with leprosy, they will quarantine you. And, you know, because it is um, a very dangerous, very contagious and deadly disease. It starts in the skin and then it stays in the skin and it gets ashy and the skin and begins to decay and leprosy can lead to the, um, to can kind of get worse or it can, um, what's the word? I can't think right now, but it can progress to where your limbs will fall off. 
fingers will fall off, your toes, your, your limbs, whole foot will fall off. That's how deadly this disease was. And such a great man to have this disease. Oh, it troubled him. And he felt so humiliated. So let's get into the story. So we know who Naaman is. We know what he does for a living. He's a man of valor, a chief valor, V-A-L-O-R. And he's the captain, the chief military commander. So we're going to pick up the story about this man and what happened to him. We're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to start reading from verse 9. Again, I always encourage you to read, read the chapter, read, go back and study it for yourself because you will get much, much more out of it. I'm giving you a little cherry on top. You go back and you dig it all up, all right? And you'll get more out of this because this chapter is full of so many lessons that when I was studying it to bring it to you, man... The message was two hours. I had to be chipping away stuff like, oh, I want to share this. Oh, I want to share that. There is so much to share. So go back and read it. Verse nine. So Naaman came with horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. So when he, he, he knew that he had this leprosy and he, you know, didn't know what to do. So let me just go back into the story. So he you know, it was embarrassing. So they had taken this little girl from, because remember they won the war against um, Israel. So they had taken this little girl as captain. They have taken her as a slave into their camp. And she was the slave or servant to his wife. And so when the leprosy was getting bad and stuff like that, he didn't know what to do. And so this little girl in verse seven, and it says at this time, the Armenians has gone out into the band and they have taken a young girl from the land of Israel and she was serving Naaman's wife, what I just said. So this little girl says to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, the reason why I said this chapter is loaded, because I want to pause right here, and I'm going to pause right here, because this was a servant girl. She was taken captive, and she was brought into their camp to be a slave to his wife. Watch this. She's a servant girl. And she then says to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now to all these raggedy men who always like to put down women and think women should be under their feet and think that women shouldn't preach and women shouldn't teach and women should be silent in the church. I don't know what Bible they are reading. I don't know what God they are serving because had this little girl not opened up her mouth to spread the word because you see, just like how I say to you, share the video. Somebody else will hear the word and get saved. And you share Christ in your time. Say to someone, Jesus loves you. You don't know where and how far that will take them. This little girl pointed him to the man of God. What if she didn't open her mouth and evangelize? This is a form of evangelism. Because she knew where the truth was. She knew about the God of Israel. She knew about the God of her fathers. And she pointed him in that direction. And yet men, even today, want women to be quiet. They want to beat on women and mistreat you and call you all kinds of things. And look at what this young lady did. We can't count her out. We can't read over it. Because had she kept silent. Aha. Uh -huh. Had she kept silent, this Naaman, this great man, this man of valor, and they don't give the title man of valor just to anybody. You have got to have won some wars and some battles under your belt. You've got to have some body count under your belt to be called a man of valor. And it took this servant girl to address 
this situation. She didn't go silent. So women, when men are trying to silence you, don't let them silence you. Not at all. Use your voice. God gave you a voice. Ah, I'm telling you, every time I hear these little rinky-dink, jacked up preacher talking about women should be silent and sit in the back and all this stuff. I just walk away. If you're in such an organization, church, walk away, just get out, go somewhere else. There's too many churches out there for you to be hooked up with one who looks down on women anyway. And so she said, if only the master would go to the prophet, watch this. I mean, this girl didn't mince words. She said, you got to go to the prophet. She tells him where he is and he would what? Cure him. She knew God has power. And Naaman went and told his master that what the girl from the land of Israel had said. So he went to the king and he told the king. And so the king now said, all right. He writes a letter and he sends the letter to the king of Israel. Which was kind of funny, because I'm telling you, when you read the Bible, you talk about comedy, some comedies in here. He writes a letter to the king. Now, granted, he was writing it as a courtesy, you know, as as as, as king to king, courtesy to courtesy, to say, I'm going to send my captain of the guard and you better cure him, right? So he sends a letter. So when the king of Israel gets the letter, he got angry. He was like, oh my God. I can't cure nobody. I can't even kill nobody. What's wrong with you? You're trying to pick a fight, right? You want to pick a fight. So when the king of Israel read the letter, he thought the king of Syria was trying to pick a fight with him. He was trying to start something. And so he got angry. And so he rented his clothes. And that was a sign of distress. A sign of, you know, what am I going to do here? Something has to be done. And so he ripped his garment, his kingly garment. He ripped it off. So Elisha now here, he hears about this thing. And so he comes in to talk to the king. And you see the king only rent, they call it rent the garment or rip the garment. Because if the king had a relationship with God, he wouldn't have to do that. And if he had a relationship with the man of God, he wouldn't have to do that. What he would have done was he would have said Elisha listen come we have a situation but this king also had some issues but we're not going to get into that we're talking about Naaman today and so verse 8 when Elisha the man of God heard that the king had torn his clothes he sent a message because you see word gets out when the king rent or rip his clothes word is going to get out there is a problem this is the first Houston, we've got a problem. Whenever the king or anybody or servant of God or prophet of God rent their garments, there was a situation that needed to be handled. And so Elisha came and he says, why have you torn your clothes? Please let the man come to me and he will know, watch this, and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Elisha took the lead on the situation. So Naaman came with horses and chariot and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Ah! Then Elisha, watch this. I want you to listen to the story now. Attitude is everything. Attitude is key. That's the theme we're talking about today. Then Elisha sent a messenger and said, go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be clean watch this but naaman went away angry saying i thought that he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of his god and wave his hand over the spot to cure my leprosy are not the abana and the Farpar rivers of damascus better than the water of israel Look at this condescending, arrogant, and prideful stank attitude. He's going to compare the rivers of Damascus to the rivers of Israel. He said, could I not have washed in those rivers and be cleansed? And so he turned and walked away in rage. 
people. Let's pause on that. He walked away angry and in rage. The Bible doesn't mince words when it says rage. We call something here in America road rage. Road rage is dangerous because many times when you hear the news talk about road rage, someone got shot or someone got killed. So this man walked away with some road rage. So Naaman's servant, I want you to watch this again because you see, I told you this has a lot of lessons in there. It says, verse 13, Naaman's servant. I'm going to pause for a second. That's what preachers do. We got to get everything in. Many times when you get on social media and you watch these reality shows, you hear these little lower level, you know, let me go by their category. I'm using their language because in Hollywood, they got the A-listers. And after the A-listers, baby, you're a D-E-F because there's no B-C. There's no B. It goes from A-lister to D-E-F. And then the rest of the alphabet, you just, you're not, you don't even exist. And you got these little D-lister reality stars who they get some new money. And right away, they start calling people the help, especially in the African-American community. We like to put down other people based on the little salary. You make a little millions and you think you're better than somebody who makes less than you. And so you want to say you're nothing because I've got billions and you're, you don't have a job. When money came by mental health and money came by common sense and money came by you happiness and money came by you love and they get condescending. You can tell when somebody got some new money fresh off the mint because they're so quick to call out the help and they're African-American calling each other the help. And if they, if they are, if they have a little money and they hire somebody to clean the pool, they don't show up much respect. It's a job. It's an honest job. Who are you to condescend anybody? So the next time you go to the hotel and you see the hotel um, worker, the maid, the, 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 the bellhop, you see the, wa the waiters, you know, the pool, the pool people and women. Don't be condescending to anybody because one day, one day they may save your life. They may save your life or they may offer words of wisdom to you. I just, I just get flabbergasted. Like I, 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 I literally, I'm like, what? When people are, you know, cursing, fighting with someone and they go, oh, he's, he's, he's sleeping with the help. I'm sorry. Is the help a computer? something inanimate it's a person you can't condescend another human being especially especially african-american because to us once upon a time we were the help all of us and now that we are flourishing we are not there yet but we have no right to call each other the help sorry but anyway watch this because again, I'm bringing it up because Naaman was the chief military commander. He was a big deal. And Naaman's servant says, approached him. So the servant wasn't intimidated by his title. Sometimes in the churches, oh, don't get the preacher in me. Sometime in churches, you see these little people, they get a little title and it goes to their head. You can't call them by their first name. It's like the cardinal sin. Lord have mercy. It's like you should get the, the guillotine, you know. You call them by their first name without the title. Oh my God, it's the death penalty. Give them a little title and you say, hey, Mary, hey, so-and-so. It's like, whoo. The, you know, you could, the, the glass drop. You ever see slow motion on, on some movies when the, the glass drops and it just slowly drops and then it just splatters into, into pieces. That's the reaction that these people give you when you call them by their first name because they have a little title. And so they use the title to intimidate other people. 
when you go to a church now this is not to say you be disrespectful if somebody's dr mary you can say dr so and so and when i go to the doctor you call your doctor doctor if you're outside and he says hey call me mark you call him mark but when he's in his position and in his office and in a professional setting you address him as doctor some people don't know how to draw the line between boss and friendship hmm that's another thing you know, you have to learn how to draw the line. You can be friends with your boss, but when you're in a professional setting, he's your boss. He's not your friend. And when you're at home and in your personal setting, then he's your friend, you know? So when you're in the church and you're having a program and you have to refer to the person, yes, you can say minister so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, reverend so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, but in a personal setting and a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, now my rule is, if you're 20 years old and under, don't call me by my first name because I didn't wake up with you this morning. So if you're 20 years old and under, you're going to put something. You're going to call me Miss Dahlia. You don't have to call me past or anything, but you can say Miss Dahlia. You know, young people shouldn't call grown folks by their first name. I remember Maya Angelou was on a program and this little girl looked like she's not even 16 was calling miss maya angelo i'm a grown woman and i wouldn't look at miss maya angelo and call her maya and she gets up and say maya and maya angelo says no you you haven't earned the right to call me by my first name you want to put something in front of that so there's a difference you see when people wear the title versus you earn the title and somebody just addresses you with respect that's all i'm saying you get the point but the servant approached him he wasn't intimidated and he gives him the respect he says my father so whenever you see in the bible they give the respect father or master it's giving the respect the office to which they walk in because they are about to address something and he says my father if the prophet had told you to do something great you would have done it how much more then when he tells you to wash and be cleansed i want to pause this naming you see where attitude is everything and attitude is key he's got leprosy leprosy is a death sentence a death sentence and the prophet says go wash in the jordan and he was like why couldn't you send me back to damascus to abana river what well, that's much better than this jordan river here the arrogance the self-righteous attitude the hubris and so the servant said if he told you to do something great you would do something great he's telling you to wash and be clean this man got into a rage over being made whole, over being cured. Let me put it in today's language. If you had cancer and they gave you six months to live, and somebody says, listen, go over here and let prophet so-and-so. I wouldn't even use them prophets because they all fakes. But go over to the man of God to this church and there's a preacher preaching and they'll lay hands on you. Da -da -da. And you wouldn't go to be healed, to be made whole. You're going to be prideful. This man let his anger and his pride and his self-righteous and his arrogant self would have walked away in a rage and not be made whole and not be healed and die in disgrace. Because you see, in this culture, whenever you have such a, a, a disease like that, a death sentence, it's almost like a disgrace because they usually have the superstition that it's something that you must have done while you got this deadly disease. You must be wicked on the inside. They link certain sickness and disease to, you know, sin and all kinds of things and that you didn't please the gods. And so the, the servant says, if he told you to do something great, you would. That's pride. But because he says, go wash in the river to be clean, you got it all twisted. Naaman got it all twisted, as do many of us. Many of us, many people got it twisted because they're so self-righteous. They're so narcissistic. They think because they got a little money in the bank, they have arrived and they have the right to speak to you and I and everybody else around them any old way. 
pride, hubris. And so Naaman, the Bible says, he listened to the servant. And so in verse 14, it says, so Naaman went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored and, and became like a little child and he was clean. So let's kind of rip it apart a little bit. The prophet did not come out and greet him. Look at his attitude. He expected because of who he was and his title that the man of God was going to come out and greet him face to face and then let wet, you know, lay hands, wave his hand over him and make him whole. You see how self-righteous and arrogant this man is to think that because the man of God didn't come out to greet him, he had a problem with that. That's pride, self-righteous, that's arrogant, self-importance. And so he got an attitude. He wanted him to come out. And then he starts to say, why the Jordan? He, he then condescends the rivers in Israel, the river that would make him whole, the river that would make him clean. But it's not the river, but it's the God of the river. It's the power of the God in the river. It's just a representation. But the fact is that he condescend the river that would make him clean and make him whole. This man had an attitude. He was not humble. The Bible said, humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. He said, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll free. But then he says, humble yourselves. When you humble yourself in the sight of God, God will exalt you. Let me go to it. Hold on. Because sometimes, you know, when you're preaching, you get all happy. And we say that with, um, we say the wrong, we misquote the scripture. So I don't want to misquote it. I know it very well, but hey, let me just read it. It's first Peter five. And it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You see that? In due time. I always remind you, God is not on your 24-7, 365. His clock is eternity and the time reads due season. He says in P first Peter, humble yourselves, therefore, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, for he will exalt you. Now, my pastor, wonderful man of God, Pastor Clinton H. Utterbach, he went on to be with the Lord. He, he used to always teach us when you see, therefore, listen, look at what it's there for, F-O-R. Because you see the lesson, when you see therefore, it's connecting you. It's going to be like for that reason or in view of this fact. And so let's go back to what it's there for. In verse 5, in 1 Peter 5, it says, Likewise, you younger, submit unto the elder. You all must be subject one to another and be clothed. Watch this. Be clothed with humility. A lot of times these young people, the next generation, they have this hubris, this pride that if they could get a career and get a job and get married, they feel like they've arrived and they're above other people. When you start talking about other people and saying socioeconomic status of people to qualify them to talk to you, you are full of pride. You're full of pride. And look at what the Bible says, that all should be clothed with humility. Humility is what's missing from society today. For God resisteth the proud. Oh, what? That's deadly. He says God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace, grace to the humble. 
And when it says God resists the proud, it means that God pushes back. He withstands the proud. He pushes back. Remember Pharaoh? When, when the Bible says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart against God or God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it doesn't mean that God made Pharaoh be wicked. No, Pharaoh was full of pride. And so when he came with his pride, God pushed back. So his heart became even more hard. God resists the proud, pushes back. And when God pushes back, honey, you won't be standing. Because Proverbs said this. I'll read Proverbs, Proverbs in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, for God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Verse six. Then he instructs you. Then he gives you a command. And he says, humble yourselves therefore. Because he just says, God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. So then First Peter says in verse 6, Now humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Because you see, when you're humble, he gives you grace and grace. But if you're prideful, he's going to push back and you won't be standing when he pushes back. Let's go to Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is going to be chapter 16. We're going to go to, and I think it's verse 18. Let's take a look. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It says this, pride goes before destruction. I mean, need I say more people? When God resists the proud, you're in destruction because God resists. He pushes back. He's not letting it come near him. He hates it. He hates it. Further, in Proverbs, it says there are six things, no, seven things that God hates. And pride is one of them. Pride is one of them. And he says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty. A haughty, someone who is lifted up and self-righteous. A haughty spirit before a fall. Remember I said earlier, when God resists, you won't be standing. It says, and a haughty spirit before a fall. So this man, Naaman, would have walked away from his healing and restoration out of being pride. So when you see people who are arrogant, narcissists, Stick, full of pride, self-importance. I'm telling you, that's not a good thing. And if those are qualities that you have where you think you're better than the person next to you because you wear Louboutins or you wear Gucci or you shop at this store, if you think you're better than people, that's pride and you better get rid of it get rid of it. You have people in today's society who they have to have the last word. Stop it. You don't always have to have the last word. You have people who can't say, I'm sorry. They know they did wrong. Narcissistic people will never say, you know what? I hurt your feelings. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. It's like they'll go around it, around it in circles. And it's, it's almost like for them to say, I'm sorry for them to say, forgive me. There are people who won't say, forgive me, or I'm sorry. They rather die and wake up in Satan's face than say, I'm sorry. All these are bad attitudes that you have to check. If you do something, if you wrong somebody, say sorry. And when someone comes to you and say sorry, you don't have to get in bed with them, but you can accept it and say, all right, peace, peace out. Nobody's saying you got to kiss the enemy, but you can say, all right, thank you so much for apologizing. Go in peace. You don't have to sit and have tea with them or play golf with them, but you'll be cordial because one day you might need forgiveness. The Bible said forgive because you see, you're going to need forgiveness one day. And God is not going to forget when somebody comes to you and asks you to forgive them and you cut them off and you ignore them and you 
what you call it, blackball them, you mistreat them, you lie, you talk about them, your day is coming. Your day is coming because the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever. Listen, I'm not making it up. Look it up, Galatians. Whatsoever a man sow, that will he reap again. So you want to be careful with these attitudes because you reap it again if you don't check it. Attitude is everything. Attitude is key, especially towards God. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. In due time. You got to wait on your season. Don't get into a pride and think that you can do it. Don't ex God out of your situation. You see, another pride when I was in church, uh, a wonderful friend, Pastor Martin Lewis, wonderful friend. Um, she's now a pastor at Awesome Words Ministry. And I'll never forget, she says, you know, when you don't stand in faith, when you have a problem and you catch an attitude and, and, and you, you don't bring it to God, she said it's another form of pride because you think God can't handle it. You think you can do a better job than God? And a lot of people, they have situations. They want to buy a house, a car. I always have to go to these little, little, little lower level examples because you get a lot of that when people come to you with their problems. They want to buy a house. They want to buy a car. They want a job. They want to get married. Some of them know it's not the season. They know the man ain't right. They know the woman is not right. It's not right. Oh, but they want to do it their way. They want to hurry God. They want to hurry ahead of God because they want to be like the Joneses. And they don't take it before God. They don't even ask God before. They go and they do it. And then they want God to come and bless it. That's pride. That's pride. He says, God resists the proud. But you, when you humble, he gives you grace. So if there's something that you aspire to, whether it's a career, whether it's something that, you know, it's um, something that, you know, will bless your life, a house, a car, a husband, a wife, bring it before God before it gets off the ground. Say, God, is this your will for me? God, is this your purpose for me? When it comes to ministry. Some people say they feel like God is calling them to ministry, but then they go chasing after the rainbow because they want this. They want to do it their way. They go chasing after the rainbow. But if God called you to ministry, then ask him, Lord, what is it? What direction should I go? And wait for him to answer. If you want to get married, if you want to buy a house, if you want that job, ask him, God, is this the job for me? Ask him. In fact, give him full reign. Say, God, help me to select. Show me what to do. Show me the way that I ought to go. Isn't it the same scripture in Job? Let me go to it here because I'm preaching now. When he says he knows the way, let's see, this little thing here is no good. Hold on. I want to find that Job quote. Uh, whoops. He knows the way. I want to, I want to quote it properly. Let's see. It's in Job 23 verse 10 and this is job speaking and he says but he knows the way i take but he knows the way i take you see that i want you to hear that god knows the way that we take and nothing takes him by surprise he knows where i'm going so if God knows where you're going, why not consult him before you go to make sure that you're going the right way? David said he leads, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When God leads, then you'll be in the path of righteousness. But God's got to be leading. But many people are out there marrying. That's why the Bible says in the last days, they'll be marrying and giving into marriage and all this stuff. And they'll be wiling. 
And then God is going to come and they're going to get left behind. You can't go do something and then tell God, here it is, bless it. It doesn't work. Whatsoever a man sow, he will reap. He says, God resists the proud, resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Naaman repented. Naaman repented. Because when he got healed and he got up from the water, the Bible said he repented and he offered to pay. And the man of God says, no, I don't want any money from you. The man of God repent said, no, he refused to take any money from him. And the Bible said, Naaman then says to him, now some scholars debate whether it happened before or was it something future, but he repented and he says, listen, I am the right hand of the king because he's the captain of the military. And he says, when he goes in to worship these idols, I bow, I bow down. So forgive me, please bless me, forgive me, because now I know that the God of Israel is the only God. So not only was he made whole, like Jesus did in the book of John with the blind man, he, he was made whole physically, but Naaman was made whole spiritually because he knew that God, the God of Israel, was the only God and the God. And so now he didn't want to serve the idols anymore. And so he asked the man of God to forgive him and to bless him because as the chief captain of the host, he had to go with the king. When the king goes into his idols, he has to be there because he's the captain. He has to watch the king. He's like secret service. And so when the king goes and bows before these idols and stuff, he got to bow too because he's watching. And so he repents. So this shows you that his heart turned from the rage. His heart turned from the anger and he was humbled. Listen to me, folks. Humble yourselves today. If you were high-minded, humble yourselves today. If you were self-righteous and you want to be important, humble yourself today. If you need to say, I'm sorry, humble yourself today and stop having the last word. You don't have to have the last word in an argument, a debate. Humble yourself. Take the high road. Why? Because God will give you grace and grace and grace. And then in due season, he will exalt you. So if you're right, if you're right in your argument with your husband, you're right in your argument with your family, humble yourselves to God. Notice he says, humble before God. He ain't talking about them. He said, humble before God. And in due season, he will exalt you. So you know what? Don't have the last say. Don't have the last word. Just humble before God. Let him handle it. And in due time, he's going to exalt you. And then they will see that you were right. If you were right. But if you ain't right, then you need to be quiet and stop having the last say and say, I'm sorry. So attitude is key. Attitude is everything when it comes to God and when it comes to our social setting because your attitude can cause you to miss the blessings of God. Your attitude of pride will let you miss what God has for you, the bigger picture. Naaman almost missed the bigger picture, being made whole spiritually and being made whole physically. He would have missed that bigger picture because of his attitude, the pride, self-importance. So don't let your attitude block you. Don't be your own worst enemy. Stop it right now. So check yourself. Ask God to search you and humble yourself to God and ask him whatever you're about to do, whatever you think you need to say to somebody, ask God first. Say, Lord, should I say this? Because you know, when you want to read somebody, sometimes the best read and the best comeback come when you walk away and you're sitting in your car driving, you're like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that. Oh, no, 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 no. You ask God, Lord, how should I respond? Don't react. Lord, how should I respond? Let God give you the right words to say. Don't be a know-it-all. Humble yourself because attitude is everything.
attitude is key. I hope this lesson was a blessing to you. I always go over my time, forgive me, but I hope the lesson was a blessing to you. Share it with someone, bless it, like the video. Remember, subscribe if you didn't. Thank you to all the new subscribers. God bless you. And remember, go with God and continue to be a blessing because you are blessed to be a blessing. Thank you for watching.